Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, John. Dan, obviously I missed the email on the Sages University logo, so I'd be happy to redo my slides uh, and put that on. So they, the logos won't be on the slides, but hopefully the content will be, be adequate for the task. These are my um, con uh, conflicts. So we are facing a, a health care crisis with obesity, and it's become apparent that obesity may in fact actually decrease expect life expectancy in our generation, which would be the first time ever. And this uh, article is 10 years old now, and, and we've slowed the obesity curve a bit, but it's still uh, as prevalent and has not decreased in the last decade. So the cost of obesity is also huge. It's uh, $93 billion estimated from the most recent estimates about almost 10% of U.S. healthcare expenditures. And that's not including all the non-surgical, uh, non-medical, non-things, diets that people spend millions and millions of dollars on. Uh, the incidence of things you might not even think about in terms of mental disorder, um, arthritis, and other things are significantly increased in patients with obesity, as are things you would expect, like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. And, um, even just class one obesity, which is, uh, I'll show you the characteristics in a second, uh, but this is a study that I think is, is very telling. It talks about uh, a large number of uh, studies that involved over a million people uh, with whom the BMI was available, and they tracked the BMI versus death rates for five to eight years in follow-up, and the mortality was 30% greater for each five BMI units above 25. 25 is normal, 25 to 30 is overweight, so even if you went from 25 to 30, that had a 30% increase in mortality uh, because of risk of diabetes, heart attack, stroke, and other things. And life expectancy was decreased by three years with uh, class one obesity, which is BMI from 30 to 35. So comorbid medical conditions that uh, are highly associated with obesity, I'm gonna run through these fairly quickly, but some of you may, may have obviously thought about as you're uh, taking care of patients, but others that are not so obvious, things like asthma and GERD are very pretty, pretty prevalent. Cardiac arrhythmias, we see a lot of death in patients who are in their mid-30s and 40s, uh, young men who are overweight and drop dead uh, from cardiac arrhythmias. Stress urinary incontinence is something that's not frequently talked about, but a highly uh, problematic problem. Non-alcoholic steatotic hepatitis is, uh, uh, is a cause of liver failure and liver transplant in patients who are overweight and um, just from uh, from uh, fatty liver disease. Migraine headaches, pseudotumor cerebri is highly correlated to obesity. Um, venous stasis disease is almost unfixable unless you fix the weight. Increased incidence of various types of cancer, and that's why the death rate is usually different for the obese. It's oftentimes the difference in cancer rates between breast, uterus, pancreas, and prostate. And finally, the things that really get patients oftentimes coming in to see you for bariatric surgery, and that is the social stigmatization, job discrimination, and restriction on things of their lifestyle that make them finally do that. Or the other thing is they decide they really want to live to see their grandchildren grow up and so forth. Uh, obesity discrimination is, in fact, I think, the last discrimination barrier. Uh, we've, you know, discriminated against uh, race, sex, uh, creed, religious creed, and so forth. But there is still the obesity discrimination in society and industry. There's no question that there's discrimination in hiring and job markets. Uh, the data for denials of insurance do not support them because, the, I mean, the patients are denied access to care because of insurance company discrimination on this. And there's, uh, in fact, if you do bariatric surgery, you have to pay higher malpractice premiums, but actually the incidence of bariatric malpractice is not any higher than the general population, but it's just, we're discriminated there as well. So it's, it's really an issue. And if you do this kind of work, you have to just live with it because um, you try to fight it. You know, there's obesity action coalitions and so forth, but it, the needle has not swung yet. And in general, I think society still holds a significant discrimination against obesity. Now, medical weight loss doesn't work very well. Uh, there's lots of studies I could show you, but I'm just going to summarize by saying that the average uh, percentage of success is about 3% for any significant long-term weight loss that would likely affect uh, medical problems and therefore lifestyle and, uh, and survival. So these are the obesity categories I referred to before. If you're uh, 25 or 18 to 25, it's normal. Overweight is 25 to 29. That's me and a lot of us. Uh, obese one is a BMI of 30 to 35. Obese two is 35 to 39.9. Obesity three is 40 to 49.9, and obese four is 50 plus. And these are relatively important just in terms of categorization of who's gonna get surgery and so forth. Uh, so 
Metabolic and bariatric surgery is indicated for patients who have class 3 and class 4 obesity, BMI of 40 or over. That's, that alone is adequate indication. And it's also indicated for class 2 obesity, 35 to 40, uh, with patients who have certain medical problems such as hypertension, diabetes, and, and the ones that are commonly associated with high morbidity that are, are also associated with obesity. Now, we've been following these guidelines since 1991 when NIH consensus conference came out to, to, um, to uh, say what they were, and the guidelines are still the same. They probably really need revision. There's a lot of data to show that class 1 obesity does benefit from surgery, especially if you have diabetes and so forth. But these are the criteria we're still uh, following, and that is BMI over 40 or 35 with a comorbid medical condition, psychologically stable patient, and a patient who has demonstrated that they can't lose weight through dietary attempts. And it's extraordinarily rare to have someone come to see you that hasn't tried dieting because almost always these patients have been overweight for decades and they've had, uh, they're frustrated because they just have tried and tried and can't uh, lose its weight. Obesity is a disease and we're starting to recognize that there are significant genetic and metabolic problems that, uh, that we haven't, uh, we don't understand but certainly contribute to the fact that uh, they are obese. So when you start your practice uh, in this area and you're going to do start your picking out patients to operate on, you definitely want to follow these guidelines. I think it's also important when the patient's there, you need to talk to them about why they want surgery, what their motivation is, make sure they understand what they're getting into and what the lifestyle changes are going to be because they are going to be very significant. Uh, I have age limitations as do most people. Um, I, I don't tend to do this surgery in patients over 65. Uh, it's very rare. Uh, between 60 and 65, I think you need to assess physiology. That's my own personal. But there are lots of papers about doing it older. I'll talk to that in a minute. Uh, weight limitations. I think it becomes difficult in certain patient size patients to actually do anything physically in terms of your facility. I have a 600 pound limit on my practice because at anyone over that amount of weight, we just can't get in scanners. It's really hard to, to, to do anything on them safely. So they need to get down to that weight to be able to possibly do, I think, safe surgery. And also you have to assess the patient's capacity for follow-up. They live really far away. Can they really get back and see you? Do they have the support system? Are they riding, are they, are they dependent on a Medicare taxi that they may not be able to get and that sort of thing? That's, it's, it's really important. So especially early in your practice, if you start this, you definitely want to avoid the very high BMI patient and the high risk patients. Do the lower risk patients first. Get yourself up to speed on that. If your staff tells you that a patient has been non-compliant in terms of following instructions and that sort of thing, pay attention to that because that's really important. The patient who's non-compliant to, to, to everything you've said uh, before surgery should raise a big red flag and you should think about postponing that patient, not doing them. You evaluate, your, you should have a multidiscipline team that evaluates these patients, psychological evaluations and nutritional evaluations and those are important to discuss uh, as a group and, and confirm that patients are good candidates. And also, if a patient's had difficult previous anatomy, a splenectomy, a colectomy, and so forth, you don't want to do those patients early on when you start out. Uh, higher risk factors for poor outcomes are higher BMI, older age, male sex, and certain medical problems, renal failure, renal, uh, congestive heart failure, Pickwickian pulmonary symptoms, non-ambulatory patients, a history of significant VTE, and uh, reoperative surgery. So these are all big risk factors and you will have poor outcomes if you start to dabble in this area too much. Later on when you're more experienced, fine, take them on, but not in the beginning. Leading reasons to convert from laparoscopic to open surgery. Thick abdominal wall, intra-abdominal adhesions, massive liver size, intraoperative complications, and revisional surgery. These are the things that are going to make you have to make an open incision. And if you have those things pre-op, and you, you need to definitely talk to the patient about the fact that they may come out of the operating room uh, with a one foot long incision. Uh, age is a risk factor. I think that, as I said, if, if you are experienced and you really do the operation well and the patient's physiology is not so bad, then I think you can operate on older patients. My personal philosophy is this metabolic and bariatric surgery is meant to be a, a lifestyle, lifelong operation. I think that it should be done in patients who are younger who are going to benefit from it by the, having it for decades of improved life and life quality. But there are, I have colleagues who differ and say a 70-year-old person should get the same benefit. I personally don't uh, do the operation on older patients, and I think that's a controversial area. Most of us don't do pediatric patients. If you uh, are in an institution that does pediatric bariatric surgery, metabolic surgery, I think that's fine. And if you are qualified to do that and are pediatric surgery to begin with, that's great. But in general, we usually wait until they're 18 
just because of logistic reasons and also because when you operate on teenagers, you have to be concerned about inhibiting growth and other things like that. So there's a uh, center of excellence program now and I'll, uh, that, that uh, you have, if you're going to do bariatric surgery, you want to get your system up and approved by a center of excellence. It's now run by the American College of Surgeons in conjunction with the Bariatric Society. But the things that you need to focus on to be able to become a center of excellence include your patient selection process, your patient education, uh, getting your informed consent process and making sure that is, uh, is uniform and appropriate. Uh, you have to document your outcomes. You have to have uh, participate in the database and put patients into the database. Uh, bariatric surgery, I think, was the, probably the earliest uh, area, except for maybe cardiac surgery, that really emphasized putting database information in and getting feedback. And, and as a result, the field of bariatric surgery has decreased its mortality dramatically in the last two decades. Outcomes documentation, as a follow-up is important, uh, there's, a quali there's a requirement that you have a certain percentage of patients that you follow up or certainly demonstrate the, the attempts to make sure they follow up because follow-up can be an issue. Patients do well long-term, they don't want to come back to see you, they're doing fine. But it, uh, they, they should uh, be documented that they're doing okay by their primary care doctor or some other means of follow-up. And also a quality improvement program to obviously address any issues that might be occurring in your uh, practice. The multidisciplinary team should include uh, your, your surgeons, your program coordinator, who's an important essential person. Nutritionists are essential, as are your uh, referral physicians, because they're going to see some of the early problems and follow up the patients long term, sometimes if it's long distance especially. Uh, obviously, if you have patients with all the medical problems I suggested, you're going to need some medical uh, evaluations and subspecialty evaluations. Your OR team is important. They need to know uh, the instrumentation and uh, how to do the the operation and what's important. Your anesthesiologist has to know the techniques of what they need to do to help you, and maybe a defense lawyer. <laughs> uh, so uh, in terms of surgeon criteria, the, um, if you're, if, to be a qualified surgeon, you have to document that you've done a certain amount of cases and so forth. These standards are set by the Bariatric Society. Currently, if a fellow is finishing to get a certificate, they have to do 100 cases. Uh, if you're out in practice, then you can uh, have a proctored experience that has less volume than that. But in general, you need to maintain your volume of at least 50 cases a year, uh, have adequate outcomes that are within two standard, one, t one standard deviation of the norm, uh, two gets you a reviewed office staff and support team have to be there and appropriate. Uh, your hospital has to have appropriate and supportive administration for your program because it will take money, it will take uh, revising the toilets, it will take new beds, it will take new equipment and so forth if you're just starting up. Your clinics and your ICU facilities have to be prepared to take care of these big patients, have transport systems, lift systems, um, and the unit and wards also have to be the same. You have to have adequate amount of support personnel, and, and all these folks need to be educated in how to, uh, you know, in the care of the bariatric patient. It is special. It is different. Uh, your nurses, your nutritionists, your rehab patients, uh, your rehab specialists, and, the co and your coordinators, as I mentioned before, they're all part of your uh, review process as well. Medical specialists, intensivists, radiologists, psychologists, and exercise physiologists all get involved with the care of these patients. When you have a program, they generally, you just need to have people identified that do this and have experience, and, and then you uh, uh, qualify as, a, as an appropriate program. CMS uh, uh, gave the uh, coverage decision for bariatric surgery back in 2006. Uh, it was originally, there were two, co uh, it was American College and the, uh, American, and the uh, Bariatric Surgery Society had different review processes, but fortunately now in about 2011, uh, they came together and it's now the uh, Medical Bolic and Bariatric Surgery Accreditation Quality Improvement Program, which is uh, jointly run by the Bariatric Society and the American College of Surgeons under the auspices of the college. And that is the group that now reviews uh, practices. And it really has made a big difference in quality and outcomes uh, in the last decade, as I'll show you in some of the data to, to, to follow. So the operations that are commonly done in the U.S. now uh, and worldwide Sleeve gastrectomy is now the most common operation performed. Uh, gastric bypass is second. Uh, and I just color-coded these because a the gastric bypass is primarily a restrictive operation but has a little bit of malabsorption just because the proximal gut is bypassed with important carbohydrate uh, ramifications, which I'll talk about. Laparoscopic adjustable gastric band is now falling out of popularity fairly rapidly. Uh, as recently as seven years ago, it was just as popular as gastric bypass, but it is on a very downward curve. Uh, duodenal switch remains um, the main malabsorptive operation done, but it really is only generated about, uh, remains about 2% of operations done in the country. This is just a, uh, a diagram of the gastric band. The band is put around the proximal stomach with about a centimeter or two below the GE junction. 
It's inflatable from a, uh, a port, it looks like a port cath that's placed under the skin. You can add and, and subtract saline from the system, adjust the tightness, and it's totally restrictive. Uh, this is a sleeve gastrectomy. It's, it's done by creating a sleeve of stomach that's about, a, usually a 40 centimeter bougie is used to, to measure the size. You have to make sure it's not uh, kinked off or too narrow in any of those areas, but you best excessively, you, you just take away the excess stomach all along the greater curvature, leaving the pylorus and the antrum intact. Gastric bypass is done by creating a proximal gastric pouch that's about 30 to 50 milliliters in size. It needs to be fairly small. And then an anastomosis to the rulum of jejunum that uh, is brought up and is usually anywhere from 100 uh, to 150 centimeters uh, standard. Sometimes we make them a little longer for the really obese patients. Uh, this biliopancreatic limb is usually about 50 centimeters, and that's distal anastomosis. And so what's bypassed is distal stomach, duodenum, and about 50 at, at most centimeters of jejunum. Uh, and the important things in that area are absorption of um, calcium, of iron, but important for carbohydrate metabolism and I'll show you some of the effects on diabetes because of that uh, anatomy. This is a duodenal switch. The stomach is the same as a sleeve gastrectomy. In fact, that's how the sleeve gastrectomy got started because it's part of this operation. The duodenum is divided about two inches past the pylorus and about a 200, anywhere from a 300 to 200 to 250 centimeter length of distal ileum is brought up. And usually about 125 centimeters from the um, terminal ileum is where the Biliopancreat is where the bile and um, pancreatic juice are pl plugged in. So this is called a common channel. It's usually about 125 centimeters in most practices. Can be 150 in some. Uh, this is a new operation that is uh, not yet approved. It's called originally was called a mini gastric bypass. Now it's been reverted, being more and more called a single anastomosis gastric bypass. Essentially, what, is ha what happens is you just take an area of the, of the intestine about 200 centimeters downstream from the ligament of trites bring it up to the, uh, essentially a sleeve gastrectomy, but you don't resect the stomach, and then do a single anastomosis. There are some data on this. I will not emphasize this in the talk because it's not a standard operation yet, but I think that it may be coming, uh, and more, more and more people are starting to do it, so we'll probably see it as a standard operation in the next five years. There's just under 200,000 operations uh, for metabolic and bariatric surgery done in the U.S. per year, and this is the distribution as of last year, uh, 52, uh, 2015. 52% of them were sleeves, 21 bypass, 10 band, and 10, uh, 11 revision, one duodenal switch. So this has been a rapid, rapid increase in the amount of sleeve, percentage of sleeve gastrectomies compared to before. I'm sorry, the blue line doesn't show up too well, but that's the gastric bypasses. Back in 2003, they represented 85% of our cases now, down to 21%. Uh, sleeve gastrectomies, on the other hand, uh, didn't really get popular at all until about 2008 or 9. Now they represent over half the cases. Duodenal switch has maintained been low. And here's the adjustable gastric bands. Went up in popularity up to about 2008, where they just about were the same as bypasses, and now are falling off rapidly to about 10% of cases, and probably next year will be down in single digits for sure. Um, when bariatric surgery really started to, to get some pushback in terms of insurance, uh, reimbursement and so forth, there was a big emphasis in the field to really look at outcomes and publish them and emphasize them. And this was one of the first major studies that was done in a leading article, in a leading journal, Henry Bookwald's article, and it looked at uh, a large, large review of bariatric outcomes that encompassed, at that point in 2004, most of the procedures were, about half and half were being done laparoscopic. So a lot of the cases in this were from the days of open surgery. And it looked at 136 studies with 22,000 patients, literature search from 90 to 2003 to analyze comorbidities. And they found that uh, patients are about 40 years old with mean BMI of 46, and most of them were female, three quarters. Uh, and so this is important. The bypass, uh, gastric bypass, had about a 60% excess weight loss. The adjustable band, about 47.5%. And the duodenal switch, about 70%. Uh, the mortality, though, was 0.1.5 and 1.1 based on those studies. Current mortalities have considerably dropped for, uh, for gastric bypass, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Duodenal switch as well. More importantly, though, medical problems were highly impacted by these operations, and you can see the percent of resolved and improved comorbidities, uh, very high, over 60% in all cases, and some as high as 97% uh, for uh, these operations in terms of uh, uh, resolution or improvement. Um, just as a reference, uh, even comparing these data 
uh, which are now, now we're much better in terms of barrier, but the data of, of uh, gastric bypass way back 12 years ago, still considerably lower than most elective uh, operations that we do that are considered more advanced and so forth. And in the, you know, the reputation and the rap on bariatric surgery has always been, oh, it's, you know, mortality and the complications are too, too high, but actually that's not really true. Uh, and so I just show you that slide. So let's talk a little bit about sleeve gastrectomy. The, uh, uh, Matt Hutter uh, really published the first large experience on the data for sleeve gastrectomy from the American College of Surgeons database, and it looked at um, about 944 cases, comparing them to laparoscopic gastric bypass, adjustable band, open gastric bypass, and you can see the percentages that were done in the, in the recent uh, couple of years right prior to this thing is only 7% of, 8% of sleeves, now it's 50%, so it's gone up dramatically. But the sleeve tends to turn out to be about between adjustable gastric band and gastric bypass in terms of efficacy and also complications. Uh, the 30-day mortality for a band is extraordinarily low, 0.1% for sleeve and 0.14% for gastric bypass. So this is now the operative mortality for a gastric bypass, 0.14%. The only operation in the admin that's less is, uh, is actually appendectomy. Cholecystectomy is actually higher. Um, Gastric bypass gives you the best weight loss. Sleeve is not quite as good, and band is not nearly as good. Diabetes uh, resolution is actually a bit significantly better with a bypass, but sleeve does pretty well with other things like hypertension and sleep apnea. Hyperlipidemia, it's not as good, uh, and it's not as good as with reflux. So when, we're pre when I'm assessing patients preoperatively, I do take into account whether they have diabetes or reflux, because those patients tend not to do quite as well with the sleeve and are better off served with a bypass. Sometimes the patients don't want it, and then you have to have a, oh, excuse me, a significant discussion with them, so. All right, um, just, to, I'm not gonna talk too much about lap band, because I really think it's an operation on the way out. It was introduced in 94, it, it enjoyed extremely good success in Australia, Europe, uh, and the Best Center report showed over 50% excess weight loss at three years. Mortality is extraordinarily low. It is a safe operation, no question about that. Um, the best, uh, I think, study that uh, came out about the ban was from John Dixon in Australia that showed a definite improvement in diabetes uh, for patients with um, a lap band. And actually, this was in class, some of these patients were class 1 obesity. So it's some of the data that is available to show that any operation will, will certainly help um, uh, the, op the effect of diabetes, even if it's just restrictive. But the lap band really failed because, or has, is failing because the long-term weight loss was often not uh, maintained and not good, and patients were getting maybe 40% and then dropping down to 30 and 20%. I'd say about a third of the patients I put a band in have lost less than 20 pounds net over the last seven years. Uh, the reason for that is it's a, it's a high-maintenance operation. You have to continuously exercise and diet with the band. It's restricted, but it's not powerful enough to really do it by itself. There's a high frequency of prolapse and slippage. Oftentimes that's fixable by taking the fluid out, but then it requires two or three more return visits to fill it back up, and patients were getting either unable to pay for it because of insurance denying the payments, or they just got tired of having to do that, so their um, enthusiasm for the band has rapidly decreased. And now there are many practices that just don't do it at all. I think I put one in last year uh, total. Sleeve gastrectomy data uh, or, or evolution, it was developed by Marceau and Hess as a, as a part of the duodenal switch. Um, it was, it's the gastric part of it, and what uh, happened was when we started doing laparoscopic surgery, Michel Gagné and his group started to do laparoscopic duodenal switches, but they had a high morbidity and mortality. So they decided to break the operation up, do the stomach part first, let the patients lose some weight, and come back and do the malabsorptive part. Problem was the patients did so well, they didn't come back. They didn't want to have another operation, and all of a sudden, that was what started sleeve gastrectomy being done as an independent procedure. By 2010, the Bariatric Society endorsed it, and um, the CPT code was obtained in 2011 for it, so it's been paid for ever since. It's probably the safest introduction of a major new operation uh, in my surgical career that I can remember. Uh, most operations are introduced with, with a quote-unquote learning curve and so forth. So the data I showed you from Dr. Hutter's study uh, were just really a couple years of experience and showed that this, the sleeve was... Um, uh, safer than a bypass and uh, almost as effective. So these are um, data to look at, uh, this recently published to look at, um, uh, this is from uh, Stacy Brethauer put these together, five different studies on 
what I call medium-term weight loss and follow-up in terms of five to nine years. And you can see the excess weight loss for the sleeve is, is running right about 60% for some, uh, or pretty, pretty close, between 53 and 69% and I think, uh, 48 rather than 69%. So I think generally you can say it's gonna be close to 50% or above 50% in most hands uh, for long-term follow-up, which is about what we're seeing in gastric bypass long-term as well. So um, comorbidity resolution, again, for the uh, sleeve, uh, pretty good in most areas. The only uh, one that's not uh, quite as good as bypass is, again, uh, diabetes um, comparing the two. So talk about gastric bypass outcomes. Uh, gastric bypass has been around since the late 60s. It's, long, long, it's got a long track record, it's been around. Obviously, it's going to be here to stay because it works. And um, so the number of bypasses done in the country kind of puttered along here at 10,000 a year until right here. Well, what happened right here? Laparoscopy. That's when laparoscopic gastric bypass came into being and you can see the growth curve since. Now it's flattened out, but uh, that has uh, been the big difference in, in just being able to do that technique. More access, more patients. So 10-year outcomes for gastric bypass. These are our data, which are actually e-published in Annals of Surgery. I don't think the print copies come out yet. Uh, but we looked at 10-year follow-up data for patients because there have not been that many long-term studies. This is long-term 10-year outcome data. Uh, 300 patients in each group for open laparoscopic. Patients are about 40 years old, BMI is about 50. You can see uh, they have maintained their weight loss uh, and just uh, at, uh, at these at, at patients at 10 years, they're just below, uh, they're right at about 50% of excess weight loss uh, long term. Uh, excuse me, there we go. Uh, more importantly, we looked at the medical problems that they had and the 10 year prevalence of medical problems compared to pre-op was highly significantly less in every category. So this operation is durable, it works, and it's, there's, these are some uh, really good long-term data to show that even in the open era and, and now in the laparoscopic era, uh, the um, outcomes are, are excellent. So I'll tell you just a couple of the important studies that have been done over the years with gastric bypass to show that bariatrics and metabolic surgery uh, improves survival, which is, this was the first, one of the first major ones from Quebec. They looked at 5,000 patients. They have a closed healthcare system. They could follow them up. They followed them up for five years. Patients who didn't, didn't have surgery. 1,000 that had surgery versus 5,000 that didn't have surgery. The hospital, the difference in mortality was 0.68% for the surgery group versus 6% for the medical group. Uh, and a lot of other benefits, lower hospitalizations, less visits, less cancer, less other problems. Uh, in addition, that group then went on to do another study that looked at healthcare impact in terms of cost, and it turns out the cost of operation gets amortized over about two to three years, and after five years, this was the difference in price in terms of uh, healthcare over those five years uh, in favor of having surgery. So it's cheaper to have surgery if you follow the patients out for five years. Adams looked in Utah at the U.S. population study. He, he was able to find obesity patients based on their uh, driver's license and uh, looked at the uh, seven-year uh, follow-up in, uh, in terms of deaths and found that the incidence of deaths was 36 versus 57 for non-obese and obese patients, uh, which was highly significant. There's a long-term study going on in Sweden that still reports. It started way back 20-some uh, years ago. Uh, and it looked at uh, 2,000 uh, surgery patients versus 2,000 non-surgery patients. This was a 10-year follow-up looking at mortality, and the death rate was highly different. Uh, and the weight loss was a, even modest weight loss, not as good as we show, I showed you for our gastric bypass data. So um, this uh, more recent uh, meta-analysis found six studies that clearly showed bariatric surgery prolongs life. And the effect is most marked because of diabetes Im improvement and reductions in death due to cardiovascular diseases and cancer. So that is why patients live longer and improve uh, their lifestyle and uh, medical problems from metabolic and bariatric surgery. And I use the term more and, and more and more I, as the talk's evolving, I'm using the term metabolic because we really are emphasizing the metabolic aspects of these operations. They are not just to lose weight, they are to improve medical problems and treat them highly effectively. Uh, this was probably the very first study that was done back in, way back in 97 by Ken McDonald at ECU to show that uh, in patients who had a gastric bypass, they lived longer and their diabetes was highly well treated. Uh, mortality rate for the surgery group 9% versus the non-surgery group at 
So all those studies really, I think, confirm the fact uh, over the years that, that what we've seen is that there's no question patients live longer, do better, uh, improve their resolution of medical problems, cancer and diabetes and heart disease uh, from getting these operations. This is a uh, biliopancreatic diversion. It, is, it was the original malabsorptive operation done by Scopinero in Italy. A distal gastrectomy combined with, again, uh, sort of the same anatomy I showed you before for the duodenal switch. The biliopancreatic limb gets plugged in here, common channel of about 100 to 150 centimeters. And he actually varied his length of a common channel based on where in Italy they live, whether they ate more pasta or ate more meat. Um, and uh, so that was kind of interesting. But, his, uh, his, he had a big, long series and really showed the operation worked well. Uh, but the problem was there, is, uh, there was a high incident of mar incidence of marginal ulcer from that proximal gastric anastomosis. There was a lot of stomach that was left. And also there was the 5% incidence of protein calorie malnutrition, which had to be concerning. Uh, and you had to watch these patients and follow them carefully. Again, the duodenal switch developed by Hess and Marceau because of the uh, marginal ulcer incidence that, that took care of, get, uh, got rid of those. So. All right, so looking at uh, duodenal switch data, it's actually pretty impressive. And um, the duodenal switch, there's no question, it's, it has the highest amount of excess weight loss, um, improvement of diabetes, and hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and then gastric bypass does better than those. It does not do better than gastric bypass in terms of reflux. Uh, it is not a good anti-reflux operation. Uh, because, and as I showed you before, the sleeve is not a great anal reflux operation either. So uh, that anatomy proximally doesn't do very well for reflux. Why don't more people do it? Well, um, it, it, but, uh, oh, so in uh, several prospective randomized trials, it has better long-term weight loss. Resolution of diabetes and hyperlipidemia is better, and the lack of follow-up ability is really an issue and metabolic complications are an issue. So that, I th in my practice, I have not done metabolic operations that are malabsorptive because I just can't be sure all my patients are going to come back. Uh, if patients do need to have revisional surgery and are out there and have developed protein calorie malnutrition, it can be fatal, and that is a real problem. So I think you have to have a captured patient population uh, to do this and be able to follow them pretty well. Uh, they do, so, uh, so now let's, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and just talk about the philosophy of why these operations work. Because we've been doing this surgery for 30 years or so, 40, 50 years with bypass. And um, they work, but we really didn't investigate how. And there is more and more uh, information now available for how these operations work. So I'm going to go through that fairly quickly. But I think it's important to at least know some of the concepts of why these operations work if you're going to get into this field. So the things that you clinically observe and are clearly obvious is that there are changes that occur just not only restrictive, but also metabolic changes. Diabetes goes away extraordinarily quickly after gastric bypass. Patients lose 20 pounds and already they're off their insulin. It's just, a, it's just and it, so it doesn't correlate with weight loss alone. Uh, we know now that there's not only, and, and the patients come back and tell you, I'm not hungry. If, if the sleeve operation or the bypass, they, they don't want to eat. They have to remember to eat. It's amazing that, that there's something that goes on that increases, decreases their satiety lose this appetite. That does reverse eventually, which becomes more difficult for prolonged weight loss and maintenance of it. Uh, but it can affect motility, absorption, glucose metabolism, and gut flora, all of which have been investigated now and have been uh, shown. So we'll talk about, a little bit about this. So uh, it improves and resolves all the components of the metabolic syndrome, hypertension, lipolipidemia, and glucose intolerance and fatty liver. Uh, as I said, gastric bypass is highly effective against diabetes, uh, especially insulin-dependent diabetes. It occurs even before significant weight loss happens. And the etiology is now, uh, has always been thought to be diversion of food from the duodenum, and we now so know some of the mechanisms why. This is a very uh, important study that came out by Phil Schauer and his group in 2012, looking at intensive medical therapy for diabetes versus surgery. And it was a well-designed randomized control study. It showed that uh, the medical endpoint was a hemoglobin of uh, A1C of 6. For that endpoint, only 4 out of 41 medical patients made it, whereas 21 out of 50 gastric bypass and 18 out of 49 sleeve patients made it. So it was a highly significant difference in favor of surgical therapy. Also, there was some other improvement in terms of other drugs and other medical problems. Uh, and these are some of the data from that. I won't belabor them too much, but just emphasize this column here. Highly significant difference in all those things I just mentioned to you for bypass and also for sleeve. Um, 
Just to summarize about diabetes and gastric bypass, there have been a lot of studies that have been done in both in humans, obviously, and in animals, but also there's probably the most important ones. An obese mice study uh, was done by Rubino where he created a gastric bypass. Diabetes got fixed. He reversed the gastric bypass. The diabetes came back. That was one of the early ones that we was shown. Then uh, Ario de Paula and uh, Robert, uh, Cohen in Brazil did some operations where they took patients who were not obese. BMIs were in the 25 to 30 range and did a uh, exclusion of the duodenum, brought the ileum up proximally to connect to the duodenum, and saw the diabetes reversed. So uh, these were important uh, operations that showed that the diabetes effect is in independent of weight loss. Uh, bypassing the duodenum substantially improves glucose metabolism uh, with little or no weight loss in humans and in diabetic rats. And this, these, this is just taken from a slide to most recent Minimally Invasive Surgery Symposium last month. Uh, where um, David Cummings was giving us the summary of the literature and research that's been done, and I'm just summarizing these for you. And also we know that the duodenal nutrient passage strongly influences insulin sensitivity independent of weight loss as well. So, How does that happen? Well, the main hormones that are involved are GLP-1 and PYY, uh, and I'll, show you, I'll explain what those hormones are in a minute, but also ghrelin is decreased uh, and patients lose weight. Uh, and as they lose weight, they increase their muscle sensitivity to insulin. Uh, bile acids are also important. Lee Kaplan's doing a lot of important work on that, showing the bile acid content has changed. And the gut microbiome has also changed as well in, in post-gastric bypass. So all of these things are contributing, and it's an exciting area now. It's exciting times where we're finding more and more data on exactly what the mechanisms of these are. You should know what ghrelin is. It's a, it's a, peripheral, uh, it's a hormone that's found mainly in the stomach in the proximal stomach. Its function was primitively probably it's, uh, it, got, it, it increases in amount when you're, uh, when you're starving. And so it stimulates your appetite and is probably important in uh, primordial times. Uh, if you do a sleeve gastrectomy and you cut that part of the stomach out, there's not much more ghrelin left. And if you bypass that part of the stomach with food by a bypass, it also decreases the ghrelin levels. GLP-1 is an incretin that stimulates insulin relief, release from the pancreas. It's released in, from L cells of the duodenum, and it uh, slows gastric emptying, inhibits glucagon secretion, improves insulin sensitivity. It's probably the most important hormone uh, that is uh, involved with the improvement of diabetes after gastric bypass. It also decreases uh, satiety. PYY is a distal uh, enteric hormone that's released from the ileum in response to any food that gets undigested food that gets down there. So if you have a gastric bypass and there's no pylorus, the food goes through more quickly and the PYY gets re released, it delays gastric emptying, inhibits intestinal motility, increases satiety, and can influence glucose metabolism as well. So, um, so that's pretty much the main stuff in terms of, di of metabolic surgery on glucose metabolism, diabetes, and that sort of thing. Now, we know also that these operations dramatically improve uh, the amount of peripheral vascular disease and, um, and uh, heart disease. And that may be diabetes related a little bit, but there's obviously more stuff than just diabetes. But what is also becoming clear is that the obese person has, in general, an increased amount of inflammation that causes many of the end organ insufficiencies that arise. A lot of the renal failure, uh, a lot of the vascular disease and so forth is due to, um, you can measure in these patients, they have an increased amount of inflammatory markers and it's felt that that has a definite contribution to the process of um, increased uh, vascular disease and so forth seen in obese patients. In, and in addition, if you do operations, patients who have significant heart failure, and I've had some of these in my practice, you can see some dramatic improvement in cardiac function afterwards. And these are just two studies to show that. Uh, one year after bariatric surgery, the increase in left ventricular and just, uh, LVF in patients uh, published uh, a few years back, and then another one where they took patients who essentially were going to, on the list for heart transplants, had gastric bypass instead, uh, heart ejection fraction went from 25% to 45%, and they were taken off the transplant list. And I've had a couple of those patients in my practice as well. So it really dramatically can improve heart act, cardiac function as well. And, and the inflammation process is probably a main part of this. It's a, it's a major factor in the development of cardiovascular disease. And, and there are things that can be measured like microparticles from vascular endothelium, leukocytes, platelets, and other markers of vascular dysfunction. The microparticles are increased in patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes. 
There have been a number of studies that have shown that postoperatively after bariatric surgery, these markers go down. This is just one example, not long ago published on 14 patients who had gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy and looked at the amount of uh, markers and they had a definite attenuation and inflammatory response uh, because of improved glycemic control. So it's, there's, there's uh, several mechanisms involved with improvement of, of uh, comorbid medical problems. Finally, the last area I want to cover is uh, complications. Uh, even if you don't do bariatric surgery, you're going to see patients in your emergency room who have had bariatric surgery and you need to know if they present with uh, problems in extremis. If you can't get the patient to a bariatric surgeon and you're the one that has to take care of them, you need to know how to do this. Right now, if you want to uh, take your uh, American Board of Surgery boards, this is a fair area for all candidates who finish uh, residency. We uh, think that this should be core knowledge of how to take care of the complications of bariatric surgery. Not necessarily how to do it, but how to take care of the complications. Lap band. Well, there's really only two bad complications that happen with lap band. One is prolapse. Top part of the stomach herniates up through the band causing reflux or obstruction. And it happens about 10% of the patients, sometimes more. It increases over time. The longer you have the band, the more likely you are to have an episode of prolapse. Uh, the treatment in the emergency room is to deflate, deflate the band when the patients present with these symptoms. Deflate the band, take all the fluid out. Most of the time, they're going to get better. Give them 20 minutes, bring some water in. They can drink usually. If they're okay, they feel okay, they start, don't have the symptoms. I send them home. I have them follow up. I stay on liquids for a few days, have them follow up, and, and later on, and uh, then slowly reinflate the band in several visits to follow. Now, if the symptoms don't go away, they need to get an upper GI because they may have prolapse that is stuck. It's been out long enough and it's been up above the band long enough so it's fibrotic, it's not going to reduce. Those patients you have to take back to the OR, open up the band, reduce the stomach and fix it, uh, and uh, so it needs operative treatment. Band erosion is the other one. Uh, if it comes early on after the operation within a week or two, it's obviously due to technical error, um, maybe an, in, an, an iatrogenic injury to the, to the uh, stomach, but more often it's just uh, put on too tightly always needs operative treatment. The band has to be removed. If it's a long-term one, sometimes these are diagnosed endoscopically or uh, the port gets infected because of transmission of bacteria along it. And there have been reports of taking the band out endoscopically if it's all, it's eroded almost into the lumen of the stomach, but more often than not, you have to take them out laparoscopically. And you do have to make sure you close that hole and drain them well because they can uh, still leak afterwards. Gastric bypass complications. Oh, there's lots of those. <laughs> Leaks are uh, the most feared and the worst, uh, and, I, 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 and, and pulmonary embolism is the most uh, responsible for the most deaths, still in series now. Uh, but there are other things too, like bowel obstruction, and late bowel obstruction is a real issue and a problem. Uh, stenosis is usually right after the operation. If you, don't, if you use a linear stapler, you're going to almost eliminate your stenosis rate. Uh, pulmonary embolism, as I said, marginal ulcer is also a chronic issue, uh, anywhere from 2 to 13 percent, depending on how aggressive you are in looking for it. Operative complications represent about 2% of complications, and overall complications in the lifetime is about 15%. So anastomotic stenosis, it always happens within the first couple months after surgery. Um, patients will usually tell you, well, I was eating solids two weeks ago, now I can't eat, uh, and then for a week I couldn't eat anything but liquids, and now I can barely get liquids down. Uh, if it's after 12 weeks, it's usually associated with a marginal ulcer, but before 12 weeks, it's usually just basic stenosis. That's what it looks like endoscopically. Believe it or not, you can actually dilate that up highly successfully. Uh, you endoscopically assess them, uh, do an endoscopic dilatation, probably follow it with a second one. Then if they're still not uh, having symptoms, you can use your fluoroscopic balloon at that point to dilate them even further. And the success rate for dilating is over 90%. How about marginal ulcers? Well, literature report varies somewhere probably about 10% for most series, and uh, the etiology is unclear, but there are a lot of things that could be involved. H. pylori, smoking, it definitely increases the re recurrence of it. Foreign bodies like permanent suture instead of absorbable, uh, and ulcerogenic drugs obviously also can cause them. Uh, the typical symptoms of the patient has burning epigastric pain that doesn't go away with eating, and it's there all the time. If they've got that, they need to be endoscoped because they probably have marginal ulcer. Uh, they don't often present with bleeding, but occasionally can, especially if it's an early after surgery one. And the diagnosis is by endoscopy. That's what it looks like. Uh, you treat them medically. Uh, most of the time, they'll get better. They've got to stop smoking, uh, but if they stop smoking and you take them off their NSAIDs or other causes uh, and treat them medically with a PPI, they'll usually get better, and you can just judge their progress by symptoms. I rarely have to rescope patients if the symptoms go away. Occasionally, if I do, there's almost no ulcer present. 
Uh, they only get obstructive sequelae if they have a long-term ulcer that really scars down, and that becomes a problem that can need surgery. Uh, if they do need surgery because of multiple uh, ulcers or because ulcers have been too th present for too long, cold too much scarring, then they need to have it either revised, um, the anastomosis is revised, which is most common. Just take away the anastomosis and make a new one. Usually there's enough stomach to do that. Occasionally the ulcer is actually fistulized to the lower stomach, which has been separated previously but now is reconnected. And then that obviously, that fistula needs to be excised. Uh, Dr. Hunter up here, I had to include his reference to some success with thoracic vagotomy in these, but uh, not before they get a fistula. If they get a fistula, they got to have an operation. And reverse bypasses, uh, uh, occasionally I have done this now with patients who have had several marginal, marginal ulcers. I'll just take, take the jejunum away, hook the proximal stomach up to the distal stomach, and say, that's it, you're done. So, Bowel obstruction, uh, and early within the first week or two post-op, is almost always a technical problem and can include interluminal hematoma and so forth. These are highly dangerous situations. If you do these patients and they get an obstruction, you have to remember your staple line is vulnerable for rupture. So any increased pressure can blow up the, open the staple line. Uh, I had a patient recently who had incarcerated a bowel in an umbilical hernia and blew out his stomach staple line and before we could get him back to fix him. And he survived, but they can be on death's door from doing that. Uh, late uh, complications include internal hernias and adhesive bowel obstruction in about equal percentages for patients who have had gastric bypass, and these need to be treated aggressively. So uh, the early causes after gastric bypass, as I said, it's usually technical error or other things, but you have to operate promptly. You have to decompress the stomach. You have to revise the anastomosis, remove the clot from the lumen of the bowel, fix whatever is causing the obstruction, and uh, do it before the stomach uh, line, um, staple line blows out. That's what it looked like on x-ray. I still get false swallows post-op day one, not so much to check for leaks, but to check for the chance of distal obstruction. And if you see that, then you have to be really have a high index of suspicion that if the patient starts getting in any kind of symptoms, and you may want to get a CT scan, which if that's on your CT scan, the next step is you're in the OR to fix this. You have you got to get it fixed. Late bowel obstructions can also be equally dangerous. If you're uh, on call in your local ER and someone comes in and has a gastric bypass and has, uh, presents with a bowel obstruction, you should think operation. You should not think NG and sitting on these folks. The leading cause of small bowel transplant now is patients who have had a gastric bypass, had an internal hernia, sat in someone's ER or someone's ICU for five days, and all their bowel died, and then they had no bowel left. So don't put an NG tube and just watch them because the bowel will die. You, do, you need to get in there and fix that internal herniation, reduce that bowel, and avoid massive necrosis. The, the hernias can occur in, in any place. Obviously, there's the usual enterostomy hernia. That can happen. Uh, there's a Peterson's hernia where bowel can get underneath the mesentery of the rule limb. And there's also another, uh, any, if the bowel goes up through the transverse colon, many surgeons pull it over top, so that doesn't exist. But if you do it retrocolic, that area as well can be a hernia. And all the bowel can also come up uh, behind the stomach if you do it retrogastric. So there's a lot of ways it can get obstructed, and you need to be aware of these, know the anatomy, figure out what's likely, but, but look in there and, fi and fix it. If they don't get too descended, you can do these laparoscopically. My advice to you is always start at the terminal ilium. Otherwise, it looks like you get in there and look at it, it looks like a pretzel. You can't figure out what, what's what. Start at the terminal ilium. You know what that is. Reduce it that way, and then it becomes easy, and you figure out what's what, and you can get it reduced, and then you fix the hernia defect, and you're done. Leaks are the most feared complication. They can present insidiously. Oftentimes the patients have isolated tachycardia, isolated tachypnea. Uh, now you have to maintain a high index of suspicion. Uh, getting to them early and fixing them early is important. If they sit around too long, it gets really hard, they get sick, and the leak is uh, much more chronic and difficult to, to, uh, to deal with. Um, they are most commonly at the gastrojejunostomy or the proximal gastric staple line. Gastric afferent swallows are often accurate, but not always. So I don't really, you, don't, you can't hang your hat on those. If they still don't look good and the swallow is negative, you still need to operate on them. Uh, you only non-operatively operate if they have, they're very stable, they're responding to antibiotics, no tenderness, no, no, no significant fever, and uh, you have a small leak and you've got it drained. Um, bleeding, oh, so complications after a sleeve. Leaks are the most feared and the worst. Stenosis can be a big problem as well and often responsible for leaks. Bleeding is not too common and they do get, about 5% of people get a nausea that's almost like morning sickness. You get an upper GI, it's normal, there's no obstruction, but they get nausea. It goes away in about two months, 
So if you have a sleeve and you've made this part of the area of the sleeve too narrow and that's na uh, there's a natural narrowing there where the incisure is, if you're not careful and you make that too narrow, then what happens is you develop an extraordinarily high pressure system right here and this staple line will blow out right here. And that's responsible for most of the leaks that occur after sleeves. Uh, it's due to that high pressure system. It can occur longer, th bypass, if they don't leak in a week after bypass, they're gonna be fine. But a sleeve can come back as late as three weeks later with a leak because of the high pressure system. They present similarly to gastric bypass. The treatment is the same. You gotta get in there, you gotta close it if you can, drain it for sure either way, provide an access for nutrition, which is usually jejunal for a sleeve. It's distal gastric for the bypass. And, um, and um, put a stent in sometimes as well if, if that will help. So after duodenal switch, the complications are almost the same, treated the same as a gastric bypass. I won't go into the details of that, essentially approach them the same. Now, finally, nutritional complications. After gastric bypass, the most common ones are iron, uh, because iron gets poorly absorbed in the proximal gut, and it's the element that we have most uh, minimal amount of excess in our bodies. Uh, B12 can be low about 15% of the time, but it's rarely clinically important. It's rare, rare to get a neuropathy from it. Nonspecific anemias occur about 10% of the time, and about 2% of patients who come back losing too much weight. It's almost always because they're depressed, they've stopped eating, there's some other issue. You have to put a feeding access in them and get them over that to, to get them to survive. We don't really know the good, full story on calcium absorption. We know it's poorly absorbed. We know that patients will get um, increased uh, PTH levels. So we do supplement with calcium. Honestly, though, the data's not there that they're going to get long-term fractures and things, but it, it, it probably will happen. But, but, but bypass has been around 40 years, and we're not seeing a big instance of it. But we still, I think it's wise to, to supplement for calcium. Uh, malabsorptive operations, though, do pose a much higher risk for metabolic problems and, um, and nutritional issues. The biggest one is protein calorie malnutrition. If the patients just aren't absorbing enough protein with that 125 common, common channel, they need to be revised. They'll present with low albumins. It becomes pretty obvious. They, they, they need to be put in the hospital, put on TPN. After one or two bouts of that, you have to reoperate on them and make that bowel longer so they have more absorptive area. Um, this is a study from Hempins looking at his long-term um, effects, uh, uh, long-term follow-up of duodenal switch patients, and actually his incidence of reoperation for protein calorie malnutrition was 10%. And so it looks at the longer the patients go, the, they're still at risk. And so the, the incidence may be high, as high as 10% for long-term follow-up uh, for patients. Uh, Fat-soluble vitamins are not absorbed uh, in this operation very well either. So they need to be parenterally given. Uh, you have an increased incidence of gallstones because of low bile salts. So you should probably take the gallbladder out. And if you have someone comes in that has a duodenal switch and still has their gallbladder, they're almost always going to get stones. Kidney stones are increased as well because of calcium issues. And iron and calcium malabsorption, again, the same as with, uh, with bypass. I mean, there's, there's, uh, they're not very well absorbed. And the final thing I want to mention is any, any patient, and ER doctors know this, and you guys should know it as well. If you're taking call for general surgery and you see a bari bariatric patient that comes in has been thrown up for five days or more, give them thiamine. they got to get thiamine because uh, if you miss it and they, get, um, they don't get their thiamine deficiency treated adequately, they'll get a non-reversible neuropathy and Wernicke's encephalopathy. So uh, the treatment's 500 milligrams three times a day for five days and then orally at the same time. And uh, things that can make it worse are lactic acidosis, dialysis, alcoholism, and starvation. So, but remember, anybody who throws up gets thiamine. So in wrapping up now, in the U.S., maybe about 200,000 operations will be done. That represents about 2% of eligible patients. The biggest single issue we have now in the U.S. is that patients just still are not coming in for surgery because I think they're afraid of surgery. Or with the obesity discrimination, it's, there's a, sort of this message that you should be able to take care of this yourself. You don't need help. You should fix this on your own. Either way, we're not operating on nearly enough patients that could benefit from this procedure. Now, insurance access is a problem, but honestly, even if we insurance access wasn't a problem, we'd probably only go 4%. So. Um, there are some things now that are coming out that may get patients through the door, and I'm mentioning them briefly, intragastric balloons. They've been used in Europe for a long time, but now there's two balloons approved in the U.S. I think there'll be some patients that do this. It's indicated for BMI of 30 to 35 or 40. Um, and I think that more patients that start doing things like this will realize that, you know, they get some weight loss, they like the results, but the weight will come back because it's not a long-term solution. 
you can see this uh, weight loss long term doesn't last. So it's a temporary measure, but I think it will get patients in the door, and I do think that it's a reasonable option for patients to offer that to them as part of your multidiscipline practice. And then I think that uh, those patients may eventually come to surgery. There's a list of investigational procedures. I'm not going to go into them, but you de there's the envelope is being pushed constantly. Endoscopic, vagal blocking, ileal transposition, metabolic things. It's exciting field. It's a dynamic field. None of this stuff was around five years ago. Uh, so bariatric surgery is evolving. It is changing. Uh, it, you do have to stay, stay up with it if you're going to do it. Uh, I, uh, self of, uh, I, this is uh, a conflict of interest, uh, but one good reference you may want to use, uh, textbook. Uh, there are others. The ASMBS textbook is excellent. Sage's Manual. It's a little bit uh, old now, about seven years old, but it, and Nin wrote a great manual. Uh, other good, Dan Jones has a great book on obesity safety and practices, and the Greenfield and Sabison's chapters are good ones too. So in summary, bariatric surgery is highly effective in producing durable weight loss. Weight loss is achieved through relative safety compared to many major operations. It works, it's durable, it's safe. Patients experience major changes in lifestyle, live longer, take less meds, and uh, just overcoming the stigma and worry of having surgery is the last major barrier I think we have to providing more and more benefits to patients who could use and get the benefits from these operations. Have I got time for two questions? Sure. All right, questions. Operation most likely to result in long-term night blindness. Switch, malabsorptive, vitamin A. Which comorbid medical problem is best treated by a gastric bypass rather than a sleeve gastrectomy? Sleep apnea, reflux, hypertension, or GJG? Reflux, yes. Uh, a sleeve is not a good operation for reflux. It's about, it's about a wash, about a quarter get better, a quarter get worse, and half stay the same. So it doesn't, it's not a great operation. The following GI hormones are believed to play a role in the mechanism of weight loss and resolution of diabetes after gastric bypass, except somatostatin. The others, all the others I talked about and their roles in glucose metabolism and, um, and appetite. Incidence of staple line leaks after sleeve gastrectomy is in the range of one to three. And finally, the percentage of eligible patients that seek surgical therapy for morbid obesity annually is approximately 1 to 2%. Thank you.